Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We are looking forward to visiting with you today about whatever things are of interest to you, certainly related to gardening, we hope. <laughs> Our phone number is 7, or excuse me, 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at t-a-m-u dot e-d-u, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Uh, nice thing about email is if you need to attach a photo, you can. Uh, but uh, we always love to have folks call. Don't be shy. Uh, there, is a, there is a lot of things that I can discuss today, but I'd most prefer to talk about the things that you are finding interesting or having questions about. I can tell you that uh, with this heat that we're having, the incessant heat, <laughs> there, is, there is a lot of uh, stress and a lot of dieback and, in fact, just flat-out death on, on many of the plants that we have around the landscape. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what we can do about that today, what's in our control, uh, how we manage that. Uh, and also, I'd like to talk a little bit about the process of, of a tree uh, dying. And it, I think as you understand that, it helps you understand what you can and can't do, uh, especially at latter stages of the game. Uh, we had a, uh, uh, a question, a number of questions this week at the AgriLife Extension Office about lawns dying. And the typical thing is a picture of a lawn with big brown areas, and they are trying to figure out why it's dying. Typically, someone will indicate they are watering, uh, and uh, they just you know, want to know what's going on and how do we stop that. Well, there are a number of things that can cause a lawn to die, certainly drought. Uh, is one of them. If you don't water your lawn it, in the kind of weather we're having now, it's going to die. Uh, even Bermuda grass in some areas seems to be, uh, you know, kind of touch and go, although I wouldn't write off Bermuda just yet, but St. Augustine for sure. Uh, but it, it needs water. It needs a good soaking, and it needs it on an infrequent basis. And I know you've heard us talk about this. I know Jennifer Nations, the folks from Water Department here in College Station, uh, are talking about it all the time. But there's a right and a wrong way to water. Uh, people that want to squirt the lawn a little bit every day to keep it alive, uh, uh, that's the wrong way to water. And here's why. Uh, let's say that I took a, uh, let's say I was going to apply an inch of irrigation to my lawn. And I could either apply an inch at one time, which you can't really run the, the uh, sprinklers for the time it takes to apply a whole inch without getting runoff on most of our soils around here. So you end up having to water a little bit, wait 45 minutes, let it soak in, then water a little bit again. And that's called cycle and soak. It's real easy to do. Uh, but you're putting an inch on essentially at one time, one day. So, the other way to water that a little bit uh, would be like taking that same inch that you purchase, that drinking water you buy, and you're going to put it on your lawn, and you're going to apply it one quarter of an inch a day for four days. Well, a quarter of an inch doesn't wet the soil. It, it wets the grass blades. It wets the thatch. And it may just begin to wet a little bit on the surface of the soil, but not even a half inch deep. And so what you've done is, uh, first of all, you've contributed to the humidity of Bryan College Station. Thank you very much. Uh, but essentially, no one comes along with a squeegee and, uh, you know, wipes all that water off the grass blades to have it drip down onto the soil. Uh, it just evaporates away. And so you got essentially nothing out of your one inch of water that you paid for compared to someone who gives an inch irrigation at one time and of course, the first part of an irrigation cycle, yes, you're going to wet the foliage, and then you're going to wet the thatch as you continue to water, and then water is going to be, over, you know, more and more rolling past all of that and on down into the soil. So it's, one way to think about it is it's the last part of your water cycle. It doesn't mean the last small part, but the last, 
you know, two thirds or three fourths that, that you're really getting water in the soil from. Because when it's all over, you'll have wet thatch, wet leaves, and it'll evaporate. So w did you ply enough to actually put it in the soil bank account? That really helps. Now, when you water shallow, frequent irrigation, you essentially create a grass root that is dependent on that. And, uh, you know, the root system is up where the soil is moist, doing more growth and development there. And so when you come to hard times, there's not a good, deep, resilient uh, root system. I've told this story uh, on the radio before, but I'll, since we're talking about the topic, I'll tell you again. When I was a kid growing up, we had a bush behind the kitchen in the back of the house. And that was in the day where you could run gray water right out on the ground or where people did. Uh, and it, you know, just right from the kitchen sink and it just went out on the ground. And uh, this bush was healthy, green, a monster because every day we're water, we're watering it because we're, you know, putting water through the sink. And it did well. We moved away and within a year that bush was dead. The very first summer it died. Because a plant can't just go, oh my gosh, my root system isn't where it needs to be and change that in a week or two or a month even. Uh, it takes time. And so when you build a dependent root system by your watering habits, then you pay the consequences for that when hard times come. And so lawn watering is, is a critical. Uh, we're talking about why, by the way, for those of you who may be joining us a little later than the beginning, we're talking about why, do my, why does my lawn turn brown? What are the reasons for that? And of course, first of all, was not watering properly. Secondly, uh, check your irrigation uniformity. Most irrigation systems are not very uniform at all. Like if you put little um, rain gauges all over the yard, you know, every foot you had a rain gauge and you just covered the yard with them and you turned on your system and ran it until you should have caught an inch and then go around and look in each of those rain gauges and you would find a, a very big difference in how much water goes in each one. We strive to put in a quality, well-designed system for as much uniformity as we can but that's that's a goal, you know. It's it's uh, we can certainly improve on it, but unfortunately, there are a whole lot of irrigation systems put out there with people. I don't, in my opinion, it it's almost like they learned how to glue PVC pipe. And now they're an irrigation person, uh, and and they they just don't understand how it should apply. Actually, your system, a sprinkler head, should throw water all the way to the next sprinkler head and vice versa then from that one back to this one. And and so when you do that, you're kind of overlapping. It's like you're hedging your bet. You don't run it as long, of course, but you're getting the most uniformity you can. That's important. So if you see some areas that are kind of browning or maybe they look okay and then they turn brown pretty quickly after, after watering a few days later, uh, you might turn on your system and just look at that or even Put a couple of straight-sided containers out there to evaluate it. You know, put one in that brown area and then put one in a green area and run the watering system for a while and see what's the difference. It may be that you're just not getting water to that area. That is that is entirely possible. You may be getting a little bit, but not enough. Uh, and that's another reason we waste water is because we water enough to keep the, the uh, least watered spot green, right? And so we end up overwatering some areas so we can get those areas that aren't getting enough water quantity uh, to, to get a little bit greener. So that's another possibility, and I think something that is well worth checking out. Uh, another thing uh, would be uh, uh, insects. There are grubs that come from the, what I grew up calling them June bugs. I think we ought to call them May bugs here because they come a little before June. But um, their eggs hatch out into little larvae that become the big old fat grubs that you find when you dig in the soil. Well, they, they eat grass roots. That's what grubs love to eat. And if you have a few, and by the way, you do. You've got grubs in your lawn, no matter who's listening to this. You've got grubs in your lawn because uh, they're ubiquitous. They're out there. But when you get like five to seven grubs per square foot of lawn, now you've got enough damage to where the grass doesn't have the root system it needed. So it would be the same as not watering, right? It would be a, a drought symptom on top of the ground 
because it can't get water. Even if the soil's moist, if you don't have roots, you can't take it up. And so grubs can cause browning areas out in the lawn. And uh, the I think the third instar grub, they, they go through like molting and they little tiny grubs and then a medium size and then the large. The large one is the one that does the most damage and that's, you know, as we get later in the year, we get more of that. Uh, and so you can see some significant damage, certainly as we're going into August, that would be a, another thing to consider. Chinch bugs. Chinch bugs suck the juices out of the plant and inject a toxin in the grass plant. And that grass plant turns brown. Uh, now, grubs are often erratically scattered through the yard, often nearest maybe a back porch light or a front porch light where those beetles tend to to fly at night. You know how bugs are attracted to the light. Uh, and so maybe they're laying their eggs more in areas near that because that's bringing them together in one spot. Uh, but in general, they're kind of random. Chinch bugs almost always start in a sunny area next to some sort of driveway, concrete walkway, uh, you know, like a sidewalk or a masonry structure, a curb. Uh, and they gradually work their way out in the yard. And so you, you you come home, your lawn is green, but over next to the driveway there, there's a, a spot where the lawn is like drought stress. It's shriveling up, and so you water it, and it doesn't really respond. And the area just keeps gradually getting bigger, moving out into the yard. That is real typical, really typical of chinch bug damage. Now, there's different ways to go about determining if that's what you have. You can certainly take a sample from your lawn and take it to your county extension office. Um, if, you, uh, if you're listening to this outside of Brazos County, uh, you also may want to um, send a sample to the state plant clinic at A&M. It's, it's an easy address to remember. It's plantclinic.tamu.edu. Um, uh, I, I can look at samples here and uh, save you a few bucks and save the plant clinic uh, another deluge of, of samples because they get them from all over the state. Uh, but if you put it in a Ziploc bag and bring it to the AgriLife Extension office, I can take a look at it. And if it's take all root rot, I can find it on there. If it's grubs, I, I mean, uh, well, grubs, but also chinch bugs, I'll see them in the sample. But you got to take the sample correctly, and I won't describe the whole thing on the radio right now. Just give us a call or send me an email and I'll send you the information you need to know about how to take a sample, including a link to a little video that shows how and where you take a sample. And so we could we could get to the bottom of it that way. Now with grubs and with chinch bugs, you need to treat them with an insecticide in order to get rid of them. And so that's another reason. So drought, uh, miswatering, uh, a poorly designed watering system, and then uh, finally uh, the, the insects that can attack. Then as if we need more, there is uh, take all root rot. And when something rots the roots, what do you think the symptom would be above ground? Well, it would be, it could be a nutrient deficiency like iron deficiency, the yellowing, uh, but it will progress then into death because no roots, no growth. And uh, so that's another possibility uh, is that you are uh, uh, dealing with a take all root rot infection. That is an opportunist disease that when your grass gets stressed, take all gets the upper hand and can flat kill large areas, very irregular areas of the grass. It doesn't care about sun or shade uh, like a chinch bug would. Uh, and so you'll see the areas all over. Often they begin with a yellowing and then turn into a uh, full full browning. Uh, but that, that would be another thing that a sample could identify and that would need to be dealt with accordingly. Uh, take all root rot can attack St. Augustine, it can attack Bermuda grass, it can attack uh, zoysia grass. So all our big three warm season grasses here in the Bryan College Station area are susceptible to take all root rot. Chinch bugs, by the way, are primarily a St. Augustine problem. I, I don't know about zoysia on them. I, I don't think they're a big problem on zoysia. And on Bermuda grass, they can you know, feed on it, but it just isn't enough usually to where you're seeing the grass go downhill like you do with St. Augustine. So, uh, okay, uh, what do we do? We did insects, we did diseases, and oh, now one more. Uh, when you over-apply a pre-emergent 
herbicide from a certain family of herbicides. We call them the DNA herbicides, but that's not what's important. It's just know this. Most of the things that are for sale to you to use as a pre-emergent herbicide on your lawn are in the DNA class in the retail garden market. Uh, most of them are. Not everyone, but most of them. And so when you apply one of those, the way it kills weeds, the way it prevents weeds, is when the weed tries to sprout, it inhibits the root from growing. It just stops the root right in its spot before it goes down in the soil and, you know, develops a nice root system. And that's how it kills weeds. That's also what it can do to your St. Augustine lawn uh, if you overdo it. Uh, you know, there's a reason there's labels on insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides. Uh, and those labels are really important. And I know that, you know, it's kind of like, what do they say? Guys don't read the instructions. They don't ask for directions on the, on the map. That's just how we are. Well, when it comes to using lawn and garden chemicals, we often are of the mindset that if a teaspoon's good, a tablespoon's better. Well, if you take that mindset to a pre-emergent herbicide, you will cause major problems for your lawn. And here's why. If you have take all root rot that is killing the older root system and the grass is sending out a runner to peg down new roots but each of those roots can't get in the ground because of that force field of uh, pre-emergent herbicide preventing their development now you've got a grass that can't get water from back further down the runner it can't get water from the ends of the runner where there should be new fresh roots going in and so again here we are uh, drought damage appearance and this one would be tied, perhaps, in my analogy, to both a disease and a misapplication of a product. There are other products that can damage and weaken St. Augustine in the heat. Uh, pretty much when you get into temperatures above 85 degrees, you shouldn't be using a broadleaf post-emergent weed product either. Uh, a lot of the ones that are good to use in the spring or in the fall, when it gets into summertime, uh, you can significantly damage a St. Augustine lawn by, by using those products to kill. Maybe you've got some broadleaf weeds in your lawn and you want to kill those. Uh, well, you, you will also hurt your lawn. So if you're going to use them, you need to go as early in the morning as you can uh, and when it's the coolest part of the day and get it done quickly. Uh, normally, we're in the mid to upper 70s at night here uh, in the summer times, but this year, what are we uh, just about to set a record on the number of days where it never goes below 80? Uh, and that's the morning time. Well, if you got out at 80 degrees and got it sprayed, that'd probably be okay. You know, I'd rather not do it right now, but if you're going to do it, or do it very early. Uh, so I just gave you a whole bunch of reasons uh, why lawns are turning brown. I probably have left a, a few out here and there, but those are the ones that I typically think of, the ones I typically deal with as a county horticulture agent. And um, yeah, so a lot, you see a lot of that around town and just a lot of folks that are just like, I'm not going to spend money on drinking water for the lawn. They let the whole thing turn around. Uh, and often it will come back. Um, you know, we've been through a heck of a drought last year and we looks like we're in one of those long term 100 degrees with very little rain uh, this year. Uh, and so things turn brown. They come back green often. St. Augustine will die outright. Uh, usually Bermuda is pretty resilient, but it can also be killed by drought. But um, when you do that, you end up with a weedy lawn, and now we're back on a herbicide treadmill trying to, to get that under control. Gosh, this is sounding depressing. I, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I'm just giving you the, just the facts, ma'am. Uh, just the facts. Our phone number, 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Hey, I want to tell you about a few things going on uh, around town. Uh, Medina Hoff Winery is having their Harvest Festival in August, and it's for a couple of, or two or three, maybe four weeks, uh, in the early part of August. But that, that's what you need to know. And let me give you an email address where you can find more information. I'm going to give you some dates, but uh, just go to this email. It's messinahoff.com slash harvest dash festival. messinahoff.com forward slash harvest dash or hyphen 
Festival, and you can learn a lot more. They do a, a lot of cool things there at the annual Harvest Festival. Uh, you know, it's a good chance to you know gather with people, meet people, especially the wine lovers in the community. That you can go out there and take part in the Harvest Festival. I mean, the whole family. It's a family uh, type event. Uh, there's there's picking grapes where people can come and be part of the harvest team to pick grapes, uh, and then there's stomping the very grapes that go into making uh, Messina Hoff's award-winning ports port wines uh, and I saw some pictures of you know like a t-shirt the Harvest Festival t-shirt and there were a couple of footprints that were wine stains and so you too can have a shirt like that I think that's pretty cool so when does it begin well on August uh, 4th is the moonlit harvest number one that would be 7 30 p.m. to 10 p.m. in the evening it includes the blessings of the vine it's officially the kickoff event for the Harvest Festival that's a Friday by the way around the corner and just right on us here. Uh, on Saturday is the Daytime Harvest Festival 1. That's 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. So it's a morning time harvest. Uh, and then there there's a moonlit on the August 11th. There's a daytime on the 12th, a moonlit on the 19th, or, or daytime on the 19th, and a moonlit on the 25th, and a daytime on the 26th. So see, we go all the way through, through the month. Lots of opportunities for you to take the family or take some friends and get out and, and be part of actual grape harvesting and the smushing of the grapes. Um, and just they, they know how to throw a good party out there at Messina Hoff, and that's exactly what's going on there. Uh, so you might, want to, you might want to take advantage of that. Uh, what else around town? Well, the Rio Brazos Audubon Society is having their Birding 101 walk on Saturday, August 5th. So on Saturday, August 5th, uh, you go out to the Gary Halter Nature Center, which is in Lick Creek Park. For those of you new to the area, it's on East Rock Prairie Road. It's east of the bypass in South College Station. So uh, you head out to, to uh, Lick Creek Park. Uh, you come, if you've got some uh, binoculars, bring them. If you don't, they usually have a pair that you can borrow to look, look at birds and things. You'll walk with folks that know a lot about birds, and you, they'll talk about, hear that bird song, that's the bird this, that you're hearing, here's a, you know, look at this bird through the, my, through the uh, binoculars and so on. So the sights and sounds and everything. Make sure and bring water. Uh, it's on the first Saturday of each month. If you want more information, go to Rio Brazos Audubon. Dot org, Rio Brazos Audubon dot org. Uh, and by the way, this uh, it, normally it's an 8.30 thing. I think they're starting them at 7.30. I'm going to check on that in just a minute. I believe we got an email from them. Uh, but uh, I believe they're about to, to do that at 7.30 uh, in the morning. Let me make sure that I am correct about that. Uh, okay, can't get rid of I hate pop-ups on my computer. Yep, 7.30. 7.30 is when they're beginning them there. So... Uh, keep that in mind. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, not a lot that in August. It's kind of quiet. Certainly we have our farmer's market still going on. There's a South Brazos County Farmer's Market at the corner of University and Glen Haven, which is almost out to the bypass on University. You turn right on Glen Haven, and it's right there. Uh, there's also South Brazos County Farmer's Market on Friday from noon to 5. By the way, one one time is Tuesday noon to five. One time is Friday noon to five. On Farm Fridays out on Tabor Road, it is twenty eight sixty one nine FM nine seventy four Tabor Road. Uh, they also have some uh, a farmers market out there with locally grown produce, plants, and all kinds of things. Uh, you know, like you'd find at a typical farmers market. All the things people make and bake and and so on. The uh, Brazos Valley Farmer's Market is downtown Bryan at Main and 21st Street, and it's Saturdays from 8 a.m. to noon. And again, uh, there's what you would expect from a farmer's market and then some out there. Occasionally, a little bit of live music, too. kind of makes it fun to hang out. Oh, gosh, what else? Um, I think I covered most of those. Just make sure I've got everything. Yep, things will kick back into gear again uh, when we turn the corner on this summer and get into a little bit better weather uh, things start hopping and happening uh, all around the area our phone number is 979-845-5689 845-5689 or by email at garden success at tamu dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu you. 
I'm going to go to the emails. Phyllis has a question. Uh, uh, there's crepe myrtle uh, babies, as she calls them, coming up all over the flower bed. And so I guess those would be seedlings uh, if they're coming up like that around the flower bed. Uh, and what do you do about them? Well, <laughs> you can spray them, but usually in a flower bed, the things that would kill them will kill your flowers too. So uh, pulling them when the soil is very moist is an option. There actually are a couple of tools. You don't see them around much, but uh, it's, it's a long handle, and you put the base of it around the plant and pull back on the handle, and it just like with leverage pulls it up out of the ground. It really works really well for getting little uh, tree seedlings up, and so that would be an option other than, than the spraying fellas for them. Uh, I'm going to stop a moment and go to a call here, but when I come back, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, crepe myrtles and some of the things they've been through and a similar type question that Phyllis had. Let's go to the phones now, and uh, our phone number again, 979-845-5689. We're going to talk to Halbert. Hello, Halbert. Good day. How are you today? Doing real well, thank you. Good. You must be inside then. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm here a long time and I discovered the way to keep out of the heat is inside always. <laughs> yep. Yep. I get it. Well, what's up today? Well, I've got a, a yard that uh, has difficulty in the back in the full sun. Uh, St. Augustine and mixed Bermudas. Uh, one of my friends that lives in Missouri said, why don't you try either white clover or micro clover in your yard and see if that won't help it. It uh, puts nutrients in the soil and and there are growing advantages apparently. Any, anything like that work in this part of the country? Well, uh, clover and any legume can put nitrogen back into the soil. Uh, any plant when it dies is releasing the nutrients that were part of that plant's development back into the soil. Right. Uh, but I don't recommend that. Uh, clover is a competition. It's a weed for for your St. Yeah. Augustine grass. Uh, and so it's sprawling out over the grass and, and uh, competing for light and water and nutrients and things. Uh, and then when it dies, you've got this dead clover, uh, you know, that's in the lawn. You, you need to deal with that. Uh, but I, it just doesn't last a long time. You know, in our when it comes late uh, spring, the clovers are starting to head south. And uh, yeah. so you've got a long period of time with nothing, and so I don't know. I don't. I don't think that would be a super solution. I think maybe getting to the bottom of why is your grass not doing well and trying to fix that might be the better approach. All right. Well, I will look into that then. I guess. Okay. Well, and if you want to, you know, if you want to create that little mini meadow mixed plantings, uh, there are people that are into that and do that. You just have to talk to the Homeowners Association if you got one. I bet they have an opinion about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we predate home, uh, Homeowners Associations here. So. <laughs> well, very good. Very good. All right. Well, thank you very much for your help. I appreciate it. You bet. Thank you for the call. I appreciate that. Phone number is 979-845-5689. 845 Or by email, garden Success at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. I want to go here now, and uh, uh, we talked about the crepe myrtle babies popping up all over uh, Phyllis's flower beds uh, and, and, you know, what we can do. Uh, as far as stopping them from coming back, you know, if you cut them off, they come back, but if, if you kill them, any new ones are just coming from more seeds. So the solution to that would be, uh, and I don't know that this is going to be practical, especially if your crepe myrtle is large, but uh, getting a little pole pruner and just cutting all the the flower head uh, clusters as they fade and start to go and developing seed and getting them out of there. So you're just basically taking out as high a percentage of the seeds as you can uh, just with that pruning. Uh, but again, I, <clears throat> I suspect that's probably not going to be a practical option for you. But it is an option. Uh, I have received a lot of questions too about crepe myrtles and why are they dying and, and then if they die and they re-sprout from the base, uh, what do you do? And so let's talk about that. The reason crepe myrtles right now are have died uh, or have dead branches in them and drive up and down or all through town, but up and down Texas especially, you see a lot of it, 
Uh, that's just dieback from last December's cold. They weren't ready. And when the cold hit and we dropped into the teens, it, it caught them unprepared. And a plant that normally can take a lot of cold, if you catch it when it's not ready, it can't take a lot of cold. And that's kind of what happened. And so that, that was the initial. Now I'm seeing crepe myrtles that are struggling from a lack of water in addition to that, and especially in parking lot islands and places like that where they just are not going to get taken care of at all. Uh, and, and that is an issue for them as well. Uh, but when you have sprouting at the base of the trunk, you just cut the trunk off if it's not alive up there. Cut, cut it off. And then I would take uh, probably, well, it depends on your goal. Do you want a single trunk crepe myrtle or do you want what the more common form, which is a multi-trunk crepe myrtle, maybe three or more trunks that are coming up out of the ground? Uh, and so you would want to leave three of them, hopefully spaced apart, as wide as your root or you know suckering sprouts will allow. Uh, if you can get them kind of spaced pretty wide apart, take out all the others. Now, if it were mine, I would take out most of the others, but then I would probably leave three or four that I just take my pruners and cut the tips out of, maybe the last six inches out of them. Uh, and the reason for that is it's hedging your bet. If you were down, let's say you wanted a single trunk crepe myrtle and you only left one of those and all the rest you got rid of and then the wind blew or a dog ran by and broke it off and well now you're back to nothing. And by hedging your bet, you, you have some backups. But when you tip them, you suppress the growth. They will re-sprout for sure up at the top. They'll branch out with more. But pruning like that is a dwarfing process and for the shoot that you're pruning. And if you continue to tip it, uh, it's not going to become the same diameter and size as the trunk of the ones that you let and leave to grow. But it's a way to hedge your bet at least for a few months, maybe, until you're sure that the ones you've left are okay, they're going to they're gonna make it and do fine. That, that tipping thing is not necessary. It's just what I would do if it were mine for the reasons that I just described. Uh, but yeah, you can prune them. And actually, crepe myrtles can be turned into a really nice plant that way. Uh, I know some folks um, that, you know, are, are always getting on to folks about murdering the crepe myrtles with the way we prune them in the wintertime. They call it crepe murder. Uh, they will occasionally have a plant that is so mal pruned. Is that a word? Mispruned, malpruned, it's malpractice pruning. I know that. Uh, that they just say, you know what? I'm never going to have a beautiful, stately, smooth bark, multiple branching and forking as it goes up. Crepe myrtle. That's a one of the beauties of that plant. Uh, and so they'll cut it off at the ground, and they will restart from the base. And when you do that, all that top growth was supplied by an equally robust root growth. And so when you take the top growth out and you still have the roots, you're going to have really good vigor as it tries to regrow uh, because it's trying to reachieve that balance. And so you can get back into business with a crepe myrtle pretty fast uh, that way, uh, whether you're dealing with uh, freeze damage or whether you just have this unsightly butcher job that will never look good and you're just going to start over. So a couple of options on that. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And I know you probably aren't thinking about going out and planting vegetables uh, on these days where it's so blazing hot, but I just want to let you know that uh, this is a time when we can plant cucumbers for a fall crop. Cucumbers are, I don't know, typically about a... 45 to 50 day uh, from seed plant, depending on the cultivar you pick. So let's say you plant them on August 1st, then that's going to be in mid-September. They're beginning to ripen, uh, and uh, it could be a little later, uh, and uh, into October. And that is, you'll get a really nice harvest at that time if you plant them in time now. Uh, eggplant can still be planted now for the, for the same goal of fall planting as can peppers. Uh, we are... Uh, just about to enter, well, let me give you one more, uh, tomatoes. If, you, if you're going to try to do something to have fall tomatoes, uh, now would be the time to get something in the ground. Uh, fall tomatoes are never as good as, as the spring crop is, and there's reasons for that. But uh, if you want to have tomatoes in the fall, you can get a few. You're just not going to have the bounty. And so you have to decide, is that worth my space in the garden or not? 
uh, certainly up to you which way you want to do it. Uh, and then as we get into August, we'll start talking about uh, the bush beans, the pole beans, you know, the green beans are also called snap beans uh, that we are going to be planting. And we'll also talk about summer squash. Uh, in fact, about the 1st of August, which we're, for all purposes were there, you can plant your zucchini and your yellow squash and get it going. Uh, again, because you want to get a bush up and growing and so that in fall it can give you a nice harvest. It's a little late for all the winter squashes. That's things like pumpkins and butternut and acorn squash. It just takes those too long. Uh, so anyway, that's the plan. Hey, if you want a, a free vegetable garden planting date chart that I created, you can go to the Master Gardeners website at brazosmg.org. Uh, brazosmg.org. I believe that's right. Somebody try it out and tell me if I'm wrong about that. I'm, I always used to say .com, but it's not a .com. Okay, let's uh, let's go on to the emails again. Um, Bob has uh, sent me a picture of some elm bark markings, and if you look at an elm tree, uh, kind of in vertical, not just narrow strips, but n not round at all, but little narrower strips. There's black markings on the bark of an elm tree, and uh, I can't, you know, get up there right. Uh, close and see it or certainly can't send it to a lab to have them culture it out like the state plant clinic could do if you wanted a definitive answer. Uh, but it looks like hypoxylin canker to me. A hypoxylin is an opportunist. It normally, we encounter, normally we encounter hypoxylin with oak trees. It loves to kill oaks. It is a ubiquitous disease. And if you have living oaks on your property, there is probably hypoxylin in those trees. But it's such a weak uh, fungal attacker that it isn't until the tree gets significantly weakened that hypoxylin can get the upper hand and then finish off or, or kill the tree. And on oaks, you typically will see sections of bark, you know, big as your hand or larger, that just fall off. And underneath is kind of an olive, drab, tan, brownish, dusty material. That's the hypoxylin uh, spores that are being created. Uh, and then over time, it'll turn often a black tar-like look, which is uh, uh, Bob, what your elm is doing. Uh, and then eventually it turns even a kind of a silvery uh, uh, gray kind of color. Once it's in a tree, there's no spraying for it. Uh, if you have a tree that dies, don't worry about the spores. They're everywhere anywhere. So if you want to use it for firewood, that's fine. You're not going to increase the hypoxylin problems. What increases hypoxylin problems is plant stress. Well, last year, 100 days, uh, no, 45 days, 100 degrees, no rain. This year, looks like we're heading to one of those. Uh, and then the freeze of... 21 in February and the freeze of December. I mean, our plants are really, our trees are really struggling with all this. And add to that, maybe you built a house and there's some construction stress. Uh, but that is what you're looking at. There's nothing you can do about it. Unfortunately, you just need to take the tree out. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Uh, let's see. Let's go to the phones now. Our number 979-845-5689. We're going to talk to John. Hello, John. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I have a question about tomatoes. Uh, we have a, a number of determinate and indeterminate plants that we're limping along. I mean, they are they don't look wonderful, but they're not dead. And I'm just wondering if we just keep them alive into the fall, will they will they revive and start to... Right now, that may, they actually have flowers on them some, yeah, but, yes. but they're not, they're not uh, setting. setting any fruit. Yeah. Yes, they will. Uh, oftentimes, you're going into fall carrying a lot of foliage diseases and spider mites and everything else on those plants. Uh, and what I will often do is uh, either tip layer them, uh, which means you bend a vine down, uh, bend a vine down, and you cover let's say go, go back about a foot from the end of the vine and cover a section with soil and, and keep it moist and it'll root there. Once it gets its own roots there, then you can cut it off, pull out the mother plant with all the things I mentioned and get it out of the area. And you, you still have that good head start because attached to mom, it, it's real fast and easy for it to get its own root system. Uh, you can also do that with cuttings that you take off the end. Either with cuttings or with the tip layering, I would get me a bucket of warm water 
and just slosh the heck out of the end of that chute. Just stick it down in the water and just vigorously slosh it around. That'll knock off a lot of the spider mites that might be on there before you then do the tip layer or take it as a cutting or whatever. Uh, so that's just a little extra tip if you want to go through that. That's a great idea. We we, we probably have 25 or 30 plants that, that yeah. we can... Yeah. We could, we could, I think we could get a head start on the fall. If, but you're right. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they look like they have a lot of baggage. Yeah. So. And most of that baggage is on older foliage as yeah. opposed to the uh, brand yeah. new, although spider mites can get up into the brand new too. Uh, but aphids are another thing. Uh, and, you know, if you want to hedge your bed a little, John, you could even get your little gallon pot laying around some of those black gallon pots from buying some plant uh, and just you know, put the chute down in it, make a big, like a U-shape down in the bottom, fill it full of soil, kind of press it down and water it, and you can, it won't take long, and that pot will have a lot of roots in it, and then just cut it loose from mom. Then you can take it and plant it wherever you want. Okay, well, I, we we probably want to leave it in the area, because all of, all of that area is covered with the drip system, so mm -hmm. you probably use the same area, but I think okay. you're right we clean out some of that old stuff yeah. and, uh, and, and use the same area. That'll do it. That sure will do it. Okay. Well, that's, thank you for so much. I, I, know, I know you're working hard out in the garden, so I'm going to let you go so you can get back out in the sun and continue. Perfect. I, 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 can, I can make about two to three hours in the morning, <laughs> and, and then I'm done. I, I, it, you know, it, when you have to wash clothes every day, it's, it's tough. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes well, twice a day. I tell you what's what's tough and discouraging is breaking a sweat trying to open the garden gate to get in the garden uh, <laughs> at 7 a.m. That's ridiculous. You're, you're absolutely <laughs> right. It's uh, I'm out here feeding the squirrels. We've got probably five, six squirrels here lining up to get peanuts right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm only feeding them peanuts to keep them off my crops i don't know if you've ever had peanut fed squirrel but it it makes some really good dumplings and <laughs> okay i'll quit Thanks. you're not married to that wife of mine so <laughs> that won't work all right i'm gonna let that one go uh thank you for the call john appreciate okay, it thank you skip you bet bye-bye 979-845-5689 and i have had someone uh who keeps me in line uh let me know that the website for the vegetable garden chart, chart is brazosmg.com, not org, like I said, brazosmg.com. One of these days I'm going to actually remember our own website, brazosmg.com. When you get on there, uh, you know, there's a, you know, there will be a thing where you can click on gardening in Central Texas and then you click on edibles and and there'll be a vegetable list and a vegetable chart uh, for you to do. But check it out. I think you'll like it. It's pretty nice. Uh, now we're going to go to the emails. And let's see if I can get an email to load here. Uh, Shannon emailed, uh, talking about crepe murder uh, on the crepe myrtles. But actually, she emailed about her citrus tree that uh, she has is covered with flowers, but there's something else going on. And she sprayed it a couple times with neem oil. And uh, so I'm going to try to describe this on the radio, but imagine citrus leaves that as they're trying to form, they get all these squiggly lines all through the leaves where all the green is being eaten away and it takes on a silvery, shiny silvery look. They don't fully form in size and they're somewhat twisted and abnormal growth. Uh, that only one thing does that on citrus, and that is the citrus leaf miner. It is a little fly organism, not like a house fly, but in that same order of insects, and it lays an egg in the leaf, and the larva hatches out, and hence the na name leaf miner, like coal miner. Uh, it mines its way through between the upper and lower surface of the leaf in a very squiggly serpentine pattern. Some, sometimes people call them serpentine leaf miners. There is a serpentine leaf miner. Uh, and sometimes you'll see little brown areas in it. That's just the frass or the poop of the, of the larva as it goes through. These don't kill citrus trees, and they only attack new growth. So if you have an established tree, I would ignore them and don't worry about it. They have their own natural enemies and they just aren't going to take over everything. If you don't, if you've got a young tree and you're trying to get it to grow, 
uh, whenever you get new growth coming out, you want to spray that growth. And uh, the old leathery leaves are not going to be affected by the leaf miner. It's the tender new growth that they go after. So do, citrus will tend to put on flushes of growth through the, the summer season. And when, with each flush of growth, uh, a spray would work. And the spray you want to use is called, has an ingredient, spinosad, and I'll spell it. S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D, spinosad. And that ingredient comes in a number of products, a number of different manufacturers of products at the home and garden market where you shop for things. They're going to have a spinosad uh, in there, and you just follow the label instructions. It's, it's kind of cool because it's an organic product, but it actually soaks into the leaf tissues. It doesn't move all around the plant, but it soaks in to that leaf. And so when something's chewing inside the leaf, it might be protected from an exterior spray of typical insecticide, but spinosad is one of the ones that actually moves into the leaf and therefore uh, will kill the leaf miner. So that is what's going on, Shannon, uh, with your with your um, uh, sample. Uh, let's see. Okay, I had a, an interesting question. I, th there's a... Th I often get questions where by the time I've read the question, I'm just thinking you pretty much have eliminated everything that came to mind as I was answering your question. But I had a question that came in from Richard, and uh, it was basically uh, what Richard's looking for is a grass alternative uh, for around the property. And, uh, you know, it just it's, it's an area that's just not going to get watered and taken care of. And so what could you put down there where you would have a ground covering uh, but not grass uh, that would be tough. And here, here's the specs on what this would, you know, to be suggested plant has to deal with. Poor rocky soil, full sun, but also some shade areas. Uh, we need something that's perennial and that's evergreen. We need it to be very tolerant of drought and very tolerant of heat. Well, uh, my first thought was silk plants or plastic plants. I think they could achieve all of those, but they are going to fade in the sun, and you just have to replace them. Uh, but uh, seriously, uh, I had to kind of stop and put on my hat, uh, thinking hat, because that's that's a uh, not a common question at all uh, for me to get. Uh, he had suggested sedum, and uh, sedum, also called stone crop, is an excellent plant for that. There's a lot of different kinds of sedum, and some make a better low-growing mat um, than others do. And so you just kind of have to look around wherever you buy your plants as to what they have. I don't have a name of one. I'm just not a sedum expert. Uh, but I don't have a name of one that you need to go shopping for. But that would be a good option. And so his idea for that would be good. Another one that I would consider is frog fruit. Now frog fruit is a, um, it's a weed here. Uh, it grows very low to the ground. You'll find it out all over the place, growing wild, and uh, in fact, I think there's some frog fruit uh, at the. Um, oh gosh, the uh, as you come in toward the radio station here, uh, toward the MSC off of uh, used to be Jersey, now George Bush. Uh, there's the big ring uh, next to the park, and and there's some beds out front uh, on the street that turns in. I believe there's some growing there. I just drove by the other day. I thought, wow, I did not know they were using that in the landscape. But frog fruit has little white blooms that are just little tiny, almost like little match heads that are sticking up with little white flowers on them. It is extremely tough. I mean, it lives in the wild with no rain here in this area. It is not super easy to find, as many of the things I'm about to say as ideas are not going to be super easy to find. Uh, but it is it is a good plant. If you know anybody that's got some, I mean, you can dig it up, root it, and plant it yourself and, and sort of create your own areas because it, it's it's pretty easy to do uh, pretty good to go go with on that I'm gonna stop here and go to a call but uh, I will continue this list of the plants for the impossible situation uh, in just a moment our phone number is 979-845-5689 845 5689 or by email garden success at tamu dot e d u and by the way just to, as a reminder i do the emails when i'm here at the station i i have something before the show i have things after the show and i just am not able to 
to fully answer the emails by email. We also have the extension emails that I'm doing. Uh, but when I get in for the show, maybe the next set Thursday, but then I, will, I would get in and I, I will make sure and answer those. I try to keep them all up to date. Let's go to the phones now and talk to Frank. Hello, Frank. Hi, I've got a couple of trees that uh, were affected by the emerald ash borer. Uh, one of them is about 60% okay, and then it's got some dead areas. But the good areas are very good, the bad areas are very bad. And I'm just wondering, uh, I did do a treatment uh, this spring, and that seemed to have a positive effect where you push the chemical around the root, uh, roots around the base of the tree. Okay. But I'm wondering, is this a long-term, just a death sentence, or, or uh, should the trees be taken down to protect other trees and, to prevent and, the spread, or and they're ash trees, you said. Uh, one's ash and one's I think it's maple. Okay, well, you, if are you calling from the Bryan College Station area? Yes. Okay, yeah, you don't have the emerald ash borer. I mean, you know, there'll be a day someday where it, it gets here, I guess, and and I can't say that anymore. But uh, it has not been reported anywhere right close to us, to my knowledge, and so it's going to be something else doing that. Uh, what are the symptoms that you're seeing on the tree other than the dieback that would make you think of a boring type insect? I saw like on the internet like a line of holes maybe created by a woodpecker were evenly spaced like somebody took a drill and yes. an inch wide hole. Yes. Uh, bark peeling away the, the underground the, 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 the live part of the tree that layer uh, eaten away uh, underneath the bark for something chewing at it and, you know, little squiggly lines, that okay. kind of thing. Okay. Well, the, the holes are, this, are a sap sucker, and they're typically about the diameter and the depth of a brand-new pencil's eraser. Uh, that yep. that's a pretty good and it, it goes sideways. It looks like a machine gun went across there. Mm -hmm. uh, they just go just to the sap deep so the bird can come back and, and drink sap. Uh, and so that's not a big big deal on the trees. Uh, as far as the squiggly lines under the bark, that does sound like some kind of borer, but I'm not going to be able to over the phone just kind of tell you which one that is. Borers in general for plants, and I'm, I'm generalizing here, uh, they attack weak and stressed plants. They're very young plants that are stressed, uh, very old plants uh, too. But whenever a plant is stressed, that's when things that bore into the bark tend to be the worst. And so alleviating stresses and maintaining as strong of a tree health as you can is your number one line of defense. There are some products that a professional arborist can spray that soak into the bark that prevent re-entry uh, of, the, of the borers. Uh, but I have found that in general, those just aren't necessary in most cases. But you might want to have a professional arborist come out and take a look at it uh, and you know, get a little clearer on. I could try looking at a, at some photos if you want to send them in. Uh, I don't, I, I'm not a, an expert on just recognizing the pattern in the borers, except for on pine trees. There's a number of pine bark beetles that have very distinct patterns. Uh, but again, with the pine bark beetles, that typically is a stress tree that they go after. Okay, so, and do you have a suggested watering program for a young tree that's been in the ground for about six months just to get it through this summer? Is it like every day, every few days? Yeah, um, it's been in the ground six months. Okay, so it's got a little bit of a spreading root system by now. Not far, but it's, it's not in the cylinder that went in the ground anymore. Uh, it's spread out beyond that. I would probably, there's a couple of ways to go about it. Uh, one way would be to put a berm of soil around it about six inches high and then fill that berm up with a hose and that that berm should be wider than the root ball was that you put in the ground uh, and so you fill it with water and then all that water has to sto soak straight down from the inside that berm because it can't run off uh, there are bags called gator bags that you may see that you can purchase mm -hmm. you put them around a tree you fill them with water and they leak out water slowly at the bottom I've done a similar thing with five-gallon buckets. Uh, just drill some little tiny holes in them, fill them with water, maybe one, one on one side, one on the other side of the tree, and that's about 10 gallons of good deep soaking. Uh, the first summer, we're often watering maybe three times a week uh, or at least twice a week, uh, making sure that tree doesn't stress. 
because there's there's two things going on, Frank. There's how do I keep my tree alive, or how do I make my tree grow fast? And I would say go for the second one, not don't settle for the first one. Uh, and so we want to. That's why we do a little bit more TLC than they would need to survive. Okay, and signs of stress, there's no dead limbs. It, it, the green kind of lightened a little bit. Yes. Uh, that's what yeah. turned me on, but that, that's the first sign of stress. Yeah, the the light lightening of the foliage can be due to excessive water, uh, which affects the roots. Uh, and, and I also think that there's a certain degree to which the heat and physiological processes shutting down can do that. Uh, I know photosynthesis, there, there are temperature limits where that process just isn't going to go like it should go. And so that may also be part of the, the yellowing that you're seeing. Awesome. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, we're about out of time. So here goes our quick one. Rita sent a picture of some fig trees with little specks in the leaves. And that looks like uh, fig rust to me, Rita. There's not a good way to control it. We used to recommend sulfur, but if you put sulfur on a plant and the temperature's above 90 degrees, you'll burn plants with it. And so uh, just not a good time to be putting something like that out. There are some sprays you might try. I don't know any that are labeled for figs uh, that that would do it. What people generally do is they pick up the fallen leaves to get the spores out of there and they just keep watering and fertilizing the fig, get, get new growth, and figs typically can outgrow that kind of problem. That's the fast answer on that. Well, I see that uh, we didn't get on to the rest of the answer to Richard's questions about a grass alternative. I'm gonna, I've got a few minutes left, so I'm gonna go ahead and say what I can. Uh, another plant is Greg Dahlia. Now, don't think of the big flower dahlias. This is Greg's Dahlia is a native plant uh, that grows probably mm, foot high uh, and spreads and is extremely drought, drought tolerant. A couple of very low growing plants are creeping germander, creeping germander, and woolly stemoidea and silver ponyfoot. I said a couple is actually three. Uh, and then there's the hardy ice plant as well. These are all tough plants, but any plant that's a super drought tolerant plant. If we go back to normal rain cycles where it's raining and raining and the drainage isn't great, they will rot out here in this area. So it needs to have good drainage so that when it does rain, uh, you're not up a creek. I think I sent him a few others uh, in the email reply. I had, this is one I had to kind of lay out. Uh, but that's uh, at least a tip to get you going. Well, you've been listening to Garden Success. Uh, we're here every Thursday from 12 to 1. I'm your host, Skip Richter from Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. We'll be back again next Thursday. Uh, I invite you to tell your friends and also let them know you can listen to Garden Success by podcast or to past shows on the KAMU-FM website. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.